I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Pterosaurs are just the best. Once thought to be clumsy reptobats that needed to fall from great heights to even dream of getting off the ground, they are now so diverse and so well understood that their supremacy over the birds comes as no surprise. With each new pterosaur named, a new data point is added to the repertoire of the pterosaurologist. A brand new one, fresh off the digital press, shows us that there's still more to their diversification throughout the Mesozoic era than we'll ever know. Meet the monkey dactyl, Kun Pengopterus. To understand the cool new anatomy of the cool new species of flippy flappy friend described just the other day, we must first embark on a quick jaunt through a few levels of pterosaurian taxonomy. Did you know Edge has merch? I have shirts, stickers, and more available on the Edge Redbubble site. It ranges from Pogfish, to the adorable Simosuchus, to the Armadillo Croc, Mosasaurus, and more. Think you'd find something you like? Click the link in the description and the comment section below to get some really cool nerd stuff. First off, pterosaurs are flying reptiles related to dinosaurs but aren't technically dinosaurs themselves by several degrees of anatomical separation. Their bones are extremely hollow, more so than most dinosaurs. Most of the flying reptiles were pretty small. This makes them difficult to fossilize. It's taken almost 200 years to get a good idea of what these creatures were doing with their 186 million years. As of right now, the family tree of these critters is a bit messy. Here's what you need to know. There's the early pterosaurs, like Dimorphodon. They were the Dimorphodontids. Then you have your Ramphorhynchid type pterosaurs, with short back legs, super long wings, long bony tail with rudder, and long pincer-like jaws. You have your Anurognathid type pterosaurs, which became super small, some no larger than a sparrow. They were cute little fuzzballs with wide owl or frog-like faces, bristling with teeny teeth for catching bugs on the wing. They didn't have much in the way of tails, minus a few exceptions. Then you have the next big three classifications, Ashdarkids, Tyrannodontids, and Pterodactyloids. The Ashdarkids were the super-huge, stork-like pterosaurs, with famous examples including Hatsagopteryx and Quetzalcoatlus. They diverged from the pterosaur tree with the pteranodontids and ornithochirids. The pteranodontids had medium length back legs, huge wings for soaring, long toothless beaks, unusual head crests, and were quite large overall. Notable examples being pteranodon itself. The ornithochirids had a similar build, but they had very toothy jaws, often capped with rudder like crests. The pterodactyl-grade pterosaurs, on the other hand, diverged much earlier and did things a bit differently. They are most notable for long back legs, long noodle necks, basically no tail, and long forceps-like jaws. Of course, this is oversimplifying, but it is the pterodactyl-grade pterosaurs we need to zero in on. These guys separate into a bunch of different groups. One notable group is the tenochasmatoids. They were rather similar in overall build to things like Pterodactylus and other generic pterodactyl-grade pterosaurs. However, they went crazy in their toothy beaks with the toothbrush-beaked Pterodostro or the pincer-beaked Cycnoramphus. Early on in the pterodactyl-grade pterosaur tree, a group split off that retained some older features of the pterosaurs, but convergently evolved the more recent features of this group, and they were the Darwinopterans. These flappy beasts were unique in having a giant hole in their skull to save weight. The nostril opening, called the nerus, and the hole between the nose and eye, the antorbital fenestra, were fused together into one big hole. This allowed these animals to have big long heads filled with air. Aside from that, they had long bony tails like the early Dimorphodont and Ramphorhynchid type pterosaurs. This is something most pterosaur groups lost over time. The Darwinopteran skull is rather advanced and similar to the Ashdarkids and other pterodactyl-grade pterosaurs, but the body is old hat. Within the Darwinoptera is the Wukongopteridae, 
This group contains the brand spanking new pterosaur I'm here to discuss today. These pterosaurs are found only in China and the UK so far, and have the same characteristics of the Darwinoptera proper, but were different in the minutia of their bones that I won't bother going into here. Kun Pengopterus was one of these Wukengopterid pterosaurs, and was described in 2010 on the basis of a few rather complete skeletons found in the Jiaojishan Formation of Ibai and Liaoning provinces of China. This rock deposit dates to the middle to late Jurassic epochs, and is known for the exceptional preservation of whatever died there due to ash from volcanic activity. Kun Pengopterus was not that unusual overall when compared to its closest relatives. The hind limbs were short enough that it had a hunchbacked or elevated back look when it was on all fours. They had long tails, probably ending in a tail rudder. This group of pterosaurs is known for having soft tissue crests from above their eyes to the middle of the jaws, but many don't preserve these crests. Kunpengopterus probably had one too, but it's unknown if it was any different from its relatives with known crests. A new specimen of Kunpengopterus was described a few days ago by an international team of paleontologists from Japan, China, Brazil, and Europe. This specimen was deposited at the Beipiao Pterosaur Museum of China and contains nearly the entire skeleton, minus the back of the skull. What makes this particular specimen unique are its hands. See the hands? Looks like there's a finger bent inwards so that the whole hand looks like a bird foot. There's a thumb. Not only is there a thumb, but it's opposable. The team were able to find enough characteristics of this specimen in another specimen, and together, this gave enough reason to bunch them together into a new species. And thus, it was named Kunpengopterus antipolicatus. Kunpengopterus comes from the name Kun of the giant fish or whale of Chinese folklore, who transformed itself into the Peng, which was a gigantic, colorful bird that helped explain the northern lights. Opterus is just Latin for wing. The new species name, Antipolaticus, comes from anti for opposite and polex for, well, polex, which is the name of the thumb. The author suggests that this reversed digit acting as a thumb may also be something the entire genus had, but the other fossils were a bit more ambiguous as to the orientation of the thumb, so they kept it restricted to this new species. What does this thumb actually mean? First of all, this is the first time an opposable thumb like this has been identified in a pterosaur without reasonable doubt. The way the bones of the thumb are constructed, it would have been stuck to the hand. Opposable thumb-carrying mammals, us in particular, can oppose our thumbs by moving the entire digit from the base. We can swing it around in a bunch of directions. Kun Pengopterus couldn't do this. Its thumb was more like the backward-directed toe of the foot of a bird of prey. Both can flex the thumb enough to make a fist for grasping, but the whole structure isn't super flexible otherwise. Regardless of the exact structure, these hands were adapted for climbing. The rock formation Kun Pengopterus comes from is also home to a few other close relatives, Wukangopterus and Darwinopterus. All of them were similar, but differed in key ways that would have separated them in their ecological niche. They were able to avoid competing with one another by way of niche partitioning, with some preferring different habitats and prey items. If you want to learn more about niche partitioning, watch my video on Gaviali Mimus. I'll make sure to make a separate video explaining the concept down the line. Among the Chinese pterosaurs of this time and place, Kun Pengopterus was the most well adapted for life in the trees, and is why it's been given the moniker of Monkey Dactyl. Another common adaptation for arboreal living is highly recurved claws to dig into the bark of trees. Kun Pengopterus had these, and likely used its monkey hands and sharp claws to grasp big clunky bugs like cicadas, or grasp branches to move around nimbly through the canopies. The thumb in the fossil is almost certainly in the natural position and wasn't moved to its current position from post-death or fossilization processes. The authors ruled it out because both hands have the opposed thumb, and other specimens of Kun Pengopterus have the same thing going on. The Tiaojishan Formation, where and when our monkey dactyl lived, 
has been interpreted as a subtropical forest region with a canopy composed of Benet Italian and conifer trees with a smaller concentration of ginkgos. Ferns, cycads, and equisetids were present and provided ground cover and medium height brows for large herbivores. Petrified wood growth rings indicate the region was warm, humid, and seasonal as well. All of these foliage types and the climate means that the canopy was bustling with a myriad of different animals. Monkey Dactyl was joined by an army of mammals like the gliding Velaticotherium, Villevolodon, and Myopatagium. There were also slow climbers like the prehensile-tailed Arboroheromia. Juramaya and Agilodocodon were the more squirrely ones that just climbed with their claws and paws. The Monkey Dactyl also had to share the tree space with the dinosaurs the wyvern-adjacent Yi that could glide from tree to tree, and the climbing Anchiornithid Xiaotingia. The frog-mouthed Muppet and Yurgnathid pterosaurs could also climb around and eat insects with the monkey dactyl. I can only imagine how annoying they could be in large numbers. All of these creatures recorded in the rock record indicates a hustling, bustling canopy of a bunch of animals. It also suggests there was a lot of food available up there. The relative lack of arboreal animals in the fossil record told the authors of the new paper that either these animals are difficult to fossilize, or the Chiaojishan forest represents an evolutionary blossoming of early arboreal life that hadn't happened before. I think it's also possible both of these are true. With the oldest evidence for a true opposed pollux in the fossil record, Darwinopterans keep providing unexpected and invaluable information on the evolutionary history of pterosaurs, and now also on the history of arboreal communities. This unique clade seems to have experienced an evolutionary trajectory richer than initially thought, having been much more than an evolutionary step toward advanced pterodactyloids. That's all I got for you today. What do you think about this new monkey dactyl? Let me know in the comments section below. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.